this morning mm -hmm. when I look at my phone, I have the impulse to open it and go into YouTube or check the news or whatever. In that moment, I need to say or ask myself, is this going to contribute to my day going poorly or not? I can't control the information that's going to come in, but I can control whether or not I choose to look at it. Do I say hello? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to maintain a decent level of emotional well-being amidst horrible news coverage, whatever issues you follow, um, when humanity seems to be tearing itself apart, killing each other, prioritizing hate over love, I guess, or respect, or just, you know, forget love, decency, just being decent, you don't have to love someone and just be decent to them. How do you like focus on being your best self, connecting with those you need to connect with, doing your job as enthusiastically as you can? while the news is so bad. How does that, like, that's, that for me is a, something I think about a lot. And I thought Mike, you'd be a great person to chat with about that. Like some little strategies, tips, I'm not sure we have great answers, but something, some tools in our toolbox that we can pull out when we're reading, you know, disturbing news coverage. What do you do not to have that pull you down? So the rest of your day or week is either totally unproductive and you're sad, or you're, you know, you're resentful and you hate whatever side you happen to you know, oppose. I mean, I think both attitudes are probably not good in the long run for anyone's mental health and just being a positive human being. So Mike, maybe the first thing I'd ask you is what, you know, you know, Israel, Palestine is sort of central. There's other conflicts around the world, Russia, Ukraine, you see just civilians all over the place having a horrible time in the midst of war. How are you feeling about the news these days? Do you, do you, do you read the news? I should ask, do you read the news a lot? How do you manage it? And what do you like, what's, what's going on? Yeah. I think, well, it'll be interesting to see what or hear what you think as well. Mm. I do think there's different layers or ways about addressing these things. So the first would, be, or A, maybe there's the structural things. Am, do I have notifications on my phone? Do I mm. get, where am I getting my news? What are mm. the out? So more of a systems perspective, like what is what are the channels of my information intake and Am I creating boundaries between myself and those channels? Right. So that's, again, a more structural thing. What are the things I can do to set in place so that I'm protecting my mind from the incoming news? Right. Then there's what are the biases? What are my own biases towards the current events that I'm following? And am I even aware of those? And am I willing to acknowledge how my own biases influence how I interpret the incoming information. I think that's a great place to start. So there's the structural, then there's the how do my own biases influence the information I intake? And also, what are the biases of the people sharing the information, right? So whether it's a news channel, uh, a newspaper, a friend, a colleague, whatnot. And can I just be aware of those things? in the background maybe we'll start with those so okay so two okay so um okay so you're okay so there's two things you're suggesting to, to manage a negative news cycle one think about how you're getting that information so if you're always if your cell phone is always beside you and you're being pinged all the time with a new tweet from wh whatever you know yeah. tweeters you're following um that might not be conducive to focus and maintaining your sort of your connection with what you're doing in that moment yeah um so thinking about your sort of the, the nature, the, the, the sources of information, the flows of information that are coming at you, um, are you managing that effectively? The second thing you said, which is interesting, and I think, I, I think on the first one, you're, you're absolutely right. Like sometimes uh, taking a break from the news, having set times in your day when you mm -hmm. do read the news, maybe early in the morning is not the right time, although that's the natural way. Like the first thing we have to yeah, do is, yeah. you know, what happened. Um, is that the right time? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes maybe getting a bit of work done and then checking in the news, and you know, so it, it's going to depend. But the second thing you said about bias and reflecting on one's own bias, so that that makes sense to me analytically. Like if I wanted to get a sense of what actually is happening, I would read different news stories. I would read different, you know, scholars of different perspectives and try to figure out, okay. Where do they agree? Where do they disagree? You know, there's the saying the truth often lies in the middle. So you have to sort of put together different perspectives and combine them to make up your own mind. Um, and that 
might change over time, but that's a, sort of how you address, I think, some of your biases. You you, refl- you you identify different perspectives and you think about them. But that makes sense if we want to find the truth. What about if we just want to find some emotional peace for the day, mm-hmm. right? Because reflecting on one's biases is not easy. Reading perspectives that we don't agree with is not easy. And that could be also be a source of stress. So how would you respond to that? If someone said to you, well, Mike, you know, I've, I've taken your advice. I'm thinking about my biases all the time and I'm more... I'm just more pissed. I'm more upset. I'm more confused. I'm more sad. Um, Is there a case for de-intellectualizing things and sort of not shrugging your shoulders in a callous way, but sort of saying, I'm actually not going to analyze this. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of put it, put it aside. I'm going to maybe feel, feel about it in a certain time that I allot myself. But after that, I'll have to say, okay, how do I recenter myself around and, you know, a new thing I'm doing or a new person I'm engaging with or a new issue I'm thinking about? Um, yeah. So how, how do you, how do you, how might you respond to that? Okay. Yeah. I think whether it's the right response is just to remind people, I think we've talked about it before of the serenity prayer, mm-hmm. which can be taken religiously or not. I think even just to point out in the daily stoic book, that's quite popular by Ryan Halliday, I think it is on the the first quote on the first page references the serenity prayer. And that's Mm. a stoic stoicism book, right? Which is generally considered not to be religious. So anyhow, uh, the serenity prayer goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. So here we're taking the, we cannot control the incoming news cycle. We cannot often control external events. Generally never. (laughs) We can influence them, but we can't control them. So in this case, it's change the things I can, which is myself. So remembering that you have agency, right? And that you can take actions is really important because I know it sounds elementary, right? Or, or easy, simple, although in the moment, so whether it's this morning, Mm -hmm. when I look at my phone, I have the impulse to open it and go onto YouTube or check the news or whatever in that moment, I need to say, or ask myself, is this going to contribute to my day going poorly or not? I can't control the information that's going to come in, but I can control whether or not I choose to look at it. So that in some sense is one thing. So whether that is secondary or, or aside from knowing my biases, knowing the biases of the news coming in, et cetera, it's just simply what can I control right now? Oh, I can control not taking in the news. And that goes a little bit to what we said before about setting boundaries, turning off notifications or reminding yourself not to check the news, or as you said, something scheduling at a certain, you don't have to schedule per se, but just Mm -hmm. telling yourself, I will just check the news at a certain time. And then I think another important thing is what is the motivation here? Do I, do I need to check the, why am I checking the news? Mm -hmm. So I think one example for me often is I'm checking the news just to reinforce my already held bias. So I want to see news stories that support my bias because it makes me feel better Mm. or reinforces my sense that I am right and others are wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell me my side of the story so I can feel better. And that's usually a response to in this moment, I'm anxious. I don't know what to do with myself. So Mm -hmm. whether that's get to work, sit down, whether that's have a shower, whether that's eat food. And so I'm uncomfortable in that situation. Therefore my brain says, Oh, check the news, reinforce your bias. You'll feel better. And then you can Uh. move on. So I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but that's just what came out of my mouth. So it, it raises a larger question of why do we read? Like, why are we a a read? A, sorry, a news reading species. <laughs> uh, so you're saying sometimes yeah. we do it because we have these ideas about the world and we want a bit of validation. Yes. So we're going to search for information that reinforces our perspective of the world, and then we were like, okay, I feel whole again. Um, yes. I'm better than those people or my thoughts. Yeah, look are, how right I am. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the checking the bug. That's maybe not reading the news for validation. Just read the news for learning. Like how should we read the news? Should we look at, should we read it as 
looking to go on a moral crusade about how horrible X, Y, and Z people are? Or should we be reading it for just in some degree of intellectual curiosity, just because it's important to engage with what other humans are doing. It's important to know things and stay up to date. Yeah, I think. I mean, that's what we're told. It's important. To, <laughs> why, why, why do you read the news? Like, why do you? I, I think that's a great question. And I don't know if I have an answer. I would say currently. Sweatshirt is, this is not professional. Kind of thing. <laughs> Get rid of that. Yeah. Or maybe we'll superimpose layers of arrows pointing to David <laughs> right. on top of his sweater. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have a good answer to that. I don't think. I do say, I would say there's the standard. We need to know what's happening in the world, so to speak. Although I think we are in a, I don't know what the words are. More informed people have good words to describe these things. Uh, an information catastrophe right now, right? Since social media, since hyper technology, since artificial intelligence, since foreign, I don't know, intelligence agencies trying to manipulate Western media. Mm -hmm. There's all these things going on that are contributing to when I pick up my phone and go to the news mm -hmm. that it's manipulating me in some way, right? Or there's some sort of difficulty going on in, in our information landscape. So that being said, maybe, yeah, if you want no, have something to say about that. But why, why do yeah. you, Mike Stroh, and I'm trying to think about this yeah, in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do you even go to the news in the right. first place? Why? Right. For all the, some people don't read the news. Um, but why do we, why do you do it? Like, if you think about just you, like yeah, you okay. as Mike, yeah. like, yeah, you're right. So the quality of the information you're, you're, we're encountering should, ought to raise a lot of questions about truthfulness and all those yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but why go there in the first place? Right, what are we, right. what are we reading at cbc.ca or wherever you go yeah. initially to see yeah. what happened? Like, why I do don't we... go there anymore? Fair. <laughs> yeah. But I think one is, uh, I'm a curious person. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so I just like to know things and learn about things and, and hear what's going on. So that would be one. Another that is definitely true for me in this current reality, current time, Monday, December 11th, 2023, mm -hmm. is there is a big part of me that is uncomfortable with what's happening in the world. I don't know what to do about it per se. Therefore, I am seeking reinforcement of my own biases. And okay. I know that like, I am aware mm. that that's mm. what I'm doing. And sometimes I say, oh, yeah, hey, Mike, here you go. You're doing that thing again that's reinforcing your biases. And then I can decide, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I, I want to reinforce my bias because I want to feel better. I want to be reminded that I'm right and others are wrong. And right. other times I would say, I'll stop myself halfway through, I'll open YouTube. And of course, this goes back to the larger information landscape. YouTube is trying to keep me there. To affirm you. Yeah. So it's feeding me things that are going to either sort of trigger me or suck mm. me in. Okay. So I can be aware of that. Mm. And I can stop myself sometimes and say, oh, wow. Or I'll even curate my feed. Don't recommend this channel mm. because it's, I, I don't want to hear this nonsense or I don't, I can see how this is manipulating me to go further down the rabbit hole. Another thing would be. So hold on. Yeah, sorry, Mike. Yeah. So you you read the news primarily. You're saying, I mean, one reason is to have your worldviews confirmed. hundred percent. Okay, so that takes one. I think it's a lot of courage to. I think we all do it. I think yeah. I think that's normal. Um, and in particular, when things are going poorly, right? You're so, finding you're looking out for one an op ed, a yeah. piece of a news story, a YouTube discussion that is going to say, "Don't worry, Mike, you're right." Yes, yes, and others are wrong. And others are wrong. Okay. Yeah, and there's some. And we're saying, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, let, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I know I'm interrupting. No, 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 so, no, and no. and you're saying that that's actually something that we. One ought to recognize myself. I, I have to recognize, and two, keep a limit as much as possible, because it's probably not the. It, it's probably not. It's not helpful. It's really. not helpful long run. Short term, you feel a bit of yeah. affirmation, yes. but yes. no, it's not actually something that will lead us to where we want to go emotionally or correct. Correct. Okay. Yes, and I think you said it earlier. I also, in this current landscape, am aware that I'm purposely not listening to or reading perspectives that do not affirm my bias. Right. 
You, you so you know yeah. the, right. I don't okay. want to read this. It, it's too it annoying. Yeah. yeah, there is another part of me though that mm. is trying to seek it out. Right. So just I just thinking about yesterday, the YouTube algorithm fed me a perspective from you could say the opposing viewpoint from what I'm okay. as I'm seeing certain things. Right. And did you go there? I did. I mm. did because it was some. It was a relatively trustworthy source from right. my experience. Right. And so I listened to it and it did challenge my perspective to some degree and I actually found it quite helpful. Mm. So that was nice because it was balanced and it was thoughtful and it was honest and sincere. I think for me, it's more about the sincerity of the deliverer of the message. I think I just, it's so obvious when you just get fed a perspective that is not balanced or honest or is just like really trapped in their echo chamber. So this is interesting. Okay. So if we back up a tiny bit, um, the question, the initial question before why do we even read the news yeah. is you, your, I asked you, why is it important to check your bias mm -hmm. when, when reading the news? Why is it important to keep that, to understand how you might be trying to affirm yourself? And you're saying that actually when you, when you seek a bit of intellectual discomfort, when you mm -hmm. go out and read or listen to someone that you know holds a different perspective than your own, they might be honest and intellectually serious, but you know that they're going to make you uncomfortable because they're going to offer facts and logic that challenge what you think. Initially, we think that's not a good, that's something we want to protect ourselves from. Yeah. But you're actually saying that made you feel better. Mm -hmm. That it gives you a bit of perspective. It's like, it's like deliberate cold exposures, like you going in the tub. Yeah that that discomfort actually makes you stronger. Yes. So seeking out different, so, okay. So we have a few propositions on the table and uh, in terms of managing the news, seek out different perspectives because it's actually a more enjoyable and emotionally healthy way. One, it's intellectually healthy, of course, mm -hmm. but our focus is more of emotional health. Yeah. Um, it's a more emotionally healthy way to deal with things when you're listening to different angles, when you're just being affirmed all the time, Actually, that's probably a recipe to be more frustrated, yes. more tribalistic, more narrow, more angry, more resentful. When you hear a like, they, I, I guess the idea of the truth will set you free if you're if you're if you're seeking out different views. Mm. It actually takes a bit of the edge off. Yeah, and I um, think is that is, is, yeah, is that consistent yeah. with your? I think so. Saying? I think so. Yes, I think so. Our default setting is seek out only those that are going to affirm you. Yes, this is a recipe for poor mental health. Yes. See, if well, you seek out those who make you silent, be, who challenge you yeah. in a responsible way, right? Then you're, then you are empowered. Then you can start to make up your own mind, given that the fact you have more information in front of you. Yes. And that is a good thing. Yes. And just by dealing with someone who disagrees with you, this goes back to all the Jonathan Haidt stuff about. Yeah. It's actually important to know have friends who don't agree with you. Yes. Yes. Because um, it's actually <laughs> makes you so much better off and compassionate and smart just better yeah um stronger intellectually yeah. and emotionally so you're saying you sort of had a bit of that you watched that youtube clip yeah you you emotionally you intellectually benefited from it and you emotionally benefited from it i did okay I so did. there's something important there yeah because it it reminded me of the narrowness perhaps of how i'm holding on to a particular perspective and what's so interesting there is our minds are, you know, the hum human brain is tribal yes. and we want to be part of a, a, a coherent group and know who our friends are and who our foes are. But often that, like that doesn't make it, that's not a good recipe for happiness or emotional stability. Yeah. And I find actually just in my dealings with a lot of like politically engaged people, the more tribalistic they are or the more ideological, they, they seem to be just le less happy. <laughs> Because they, they're thinking in terms of who's on my side and who's not. Those who are sort of like, I'm really open-minded and I'm willing to change my mind seem to always have a bit more pep in their step regardless of what's happening. Maybe. And they're, they're emotionally flexible in really nice ways. Do you find... Yeah, I think that's generally true. I think we talked about this maybe before we started recording was moments when we do or when it is important in some sense to have a perspective and believe that it's right, which is complicated. Uh, and maybe it's not so much a perspective, maybe it's a value system mm. or something like that, where we can, maybe it's not, maybe it can be incorporated to what you're saying. So we can be flexible, mm -hmm. we can be open to ideas, and we can also say, 
that's all good. Maybe I'm persuaded, maybe I'm not, while holding on to sort of a value system or ethical framework for how we see the world, something like that. I don't know if that makes sense. And then I'd be curious how you deal with these things. So I think what you, so a thought just popped up as you're yeah. talking and it sounds like the, the idea we're, we're trying to like identify is don't overly attach to a perspective or yeah. a narrative of what's happening in a certain issue on a certain issue. Cause I think that attachment leads to some sort of some toxic emotions. We can believe in that you, you intellectually. And what I mean by attachment is an emotional investment in right. that view. Yeah. I think intellectually, you can say, well, yeah, I think this is right based on all the things I've studied. But if you emotionally believe in it, I think that's when maybe that's when we get into trouble. Or, or when you personalize a disagreement with it. Yes. Right. Yes. If you disagree with my ideas about this thing, then I, you're disagreeing with me. Yes. Yes. And that's a huge social and problem. If you right? disagree, yeah. you're, I'm a good, you're a bad person. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So okay. I think we want to just to re summarize a little bit of that yeah. is yeah. noticing your own biases, noticing the biases of the information you're consuming. Notice how you take sides. Right. I'm right. You're wrong. I'm better. You're worse. And perhaps depersonalize, to use a mental health term, I think, psychological term, depersonalize the ideas from you as a human being. And I think that's what's very difficult in today's world is we are, we've attached or become the same as our thoughts and feelings and beliefs. We think that they are us. Therefore, if they're disagreed with, that's an attack against us. Right, right. And that is so toxic and I think harmful. And that's what leads to war. I think Yuval Harari talks about it so well. All of these things are wars over stories that we tell ourselves and each other about mm. ourselves and each other. Mm. And that I think maybe we are in a process of evolving away from that mm. tribalism. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we, we need to have more global catastrophe before we wake up to that. But So a, a, a critic of this perspective of depersonalizing might say, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a perspective of privilege, that you have, the, you have the privilege to depersonalize. Maybe your specific group isn't being attacked in the way that my specific group is, and therefore, how dare you say I shouldn't personalize when the group that I'm affiliated with is under threat, that, that kind of thinking. Yeah. So like you, like, you know, to depersonalize requires some degree of, you know, stability and peace in your own community where you can say, okay, well, it's not me that's being attacked. So I'll, you know, I'll be a bit dis emotionally distant from it, which I think we're all suggesting is probably the most healthy for the brain, but it might not also be possible for some people. You know, if you're living in a conflict zone, if you have family in a conflict mm -hmm. zone, if you've lost loved ones, how do you, like, is there a case for depersonalizing when things are so personal? Like, how do you do, how do we do that? Yeah. How do you tell a Ukrainian, a Russian, a Palestinian, an Israeli to depersonalize right now? And an Eritrean, an Ethiopian, a Sudanese, a Yemeni, like all, all the groups around the world yeah. mired in conflict. Don't take it so personally or don't overly attach with. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you, how do we manage that? Number one, I don't have an answer. I don't have a solution right. to that. I think that is part of what it means to be a human being is to grapple with these really complex and difficult things and moral struggles or, or emotional struggles or communal struggles. I, I I think we're all trying to figure these things out. I do think there are, there's, there's a, a gap between the ideals of depersonalizing, of treating the people we disagree with, with respect mm -hmm. and understanding and compassion versus the reality that we are human beings and we're complicated and tribal. And that's very difficult for us to do. Right. I think that we, we have to acknowledge that we don't necessarily have good answers and that these things are very difficult. And if we can just start there rather than jumping to, we must have an answer now because this is terrible and it needs to stop. And that's not a satisfactory answer. I think if the specific question of if you are in a war zone or in these areas of conflict, I don't have an answer for that. Like that's complicated and who knows what the right thing to do is, but we're going back. This started with, we're, we're talking about us consuming the news. Mm -hmm. So depersonalizing that 
is a bit easier than if you were in a conflict war zone. But it can be simple as the last thing I'll say is, even if I am in a war zone, I don't know if it applies, but let's just say your family is in a war zone. Yeah. So you're right. Okay. So in the conflict zone might be a different dynamic, yeah. but you know, if we have a certain descent and we have families in, in these conflict yeah. zones and I know we're speaking abstractly of it, you know, yeah. So let's just go, on let's purpose, go, but let's, what do you then do? What do you, when your family's there? Yeah. Let's return again though, to the beginning of how do we manage our mental health in relationship to the news? Yeah. and world events yeah. so that we can take responsibility for our actions in this moment. Yeah. Just knowing that we have the agency to do that is useful. Huge. So curating our news feed, setting boundaries around our sources of information, reflecting being, on why we're reading what we're reading. Yes. And okay. what's Price, it serving? Yeah. Is it serving our egos and our you know need to be right and others wrong? Yeah. What are our own biases? What are the biases of the news? information coming in, then it's hard to say, but this idea of depersonalizing, I think it's not that it doesn't matter and that it's not important and that I don't want to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. It's right. more that if I personalize everything, I'm, I'm attached, I'm clinging, I'm, I'm, I'm not as centered or free to actually take an action that's going to be helpful and yeah. effective. Right. So that is the framework. Again, easier said than done. It's not that this is supposedly easy, but we have to know at least what, what an outcome actually looks like. So the last thing maybe would be, if I have family in a war zone, can I get them out perhaps, right? Or can I lobby my government to help get them out? Or can I do something that will help me take an action towards the outcome and yelling and screaming and pointing fingers is not going to help. So depersonalizing. So maybe I made two quick points. Depersonalizing is not calling for apathy, right? It's calling for a, a more strategic, thoughtful engagement with the thing that you want to address. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And in my studies of say human rights activism and advocacy and social movements, the, emo the emotions play an important role. You sort of have to have some degree of anger and frustration with yeah. the issue to get yeah. you there. To yeah. get you. But once those emotions die off, which eventually they do, because it's it's hard for us to maintain anger. Sure, at, sure. At certain they level come and intensity. go and come and go and come and go. Then you sort of have the, the rational mind needs to kick in. And you need to think clearly about, well, what, how am I exactly going to address this problem in an effective way? Um, so, okay. So depersonalization is not a call for apathy. It's, no. call, it's a call for a more useful, thoughtful engagement with the issues that you're trying to address yes. that bug you. Yes. Maybe the second thing I'd say is um, in every single conflict, you know, contemporaneously, historically, there's always people who are able to rise above the madness of the tribalism and the killing and all that stuff and to say things and to hold views that, you know, reflect maybe some of the things that you want to, and look, if you're not interested in, in a universalistic ethic, then maybe those people are, are not, are, are worth ignoring. But yeah. in a moment of, I just want to see someone saying, reflecting the, the ideas of a shared humanity and compassion, even if you disagree with someone or a people, um, I think you can still find those in every conflict, in every war, there's always someone saying, I refuse to succumb to hate, regardless of what the other side has done to my family. So knowing that, like you said about, you know, Mike, what you said about agency, like knowing that that's possible, knowing that it is, it is a place that we can go to because others have done it. Yes. Where, you know, Mandela doesn't succumb to hate uh, of white South, of, you know, Afrikaners. Um, maybe, maybe personally he was hateful. But at least he, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about his, his internal psychology, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but that like there, it is doable. You can go through horrific violence and actually not, not be hateful towards those who are your oppressors, even if you so firmly disagree with, and disagree with them on every possible level, but you are just saying like, I'm not going to hate you. I refuse to hate because it doesn't lead to anything, any, anything good. Doesn't make me feel any better. So how do you? I mean, that, that's a that's a tough. Play. But knowing that people have done it, like yeah, finding yeah, that role yeah. model. I remember when you know on, on our website ages ago, uh, we had a piece published about like finding good role models. Yes. So I think there's something there, like finding those people who articulate a perspective that you think is the right kind of attitude to take, and maybe doesn't succumb to some of more of our base, you know, negative emotions that are incredibly powerful in our brain, all of our brains. Yeah. And the last point on that is that yeah. this perspective or these people are generally outside of or separate from our bias 
engage current engagement with the situation. So not mm -hmm. seeking someone who reinforces our bias, yeah. <laughs> seeking someone who role models what effective solutions look like, perhaps. Yeah. And then rewinding again back to when I pick up my phone to consume a piece of information, I might even ask myself, is this going to help me in this moment? Is this actually going to lead to any form of effective progress? Yeah. And I would say 99% of the time, the answer is no. Or maybe a large majority of the time, the answer is no. We're just feeding some form of desire, self-righteous reinforcement just to feel better in that moment. And then it just stokes the division and stokes the I'm right, they're wrong, da, 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 da kind of idea. So again, curate the news feed, know our biases, know the biases of the information we're consuming, asking ourselves if this is helpful or not, and reminding ourselves that some of us, I don't even think we claim to want a better outcome, but we're not capable of actually honoring that. Mm. Or maybe we do want a better outcome. And if we do, then how is my behavior right now going to lead to that? And I would say for now, the best way we could get to that would be to regulate your own emotions in that moment when you're triggered or when you want to compulsively consume something. The, the answer is that. Hmm. The outcome is in that moment of letting go of that and redirecting your attention back to something more helpful. So I love that because, I mean, I, I feel like I've been, ha over the last few years, as I've sort of like, like tried to a bit, you know, I used to be a really into news, into the political debate, and I'm a political scientist who has to follow current events, or I think I have to. I'm told I have to. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why. Um, but one of my strategies has been just like to not do it as much, and I feel like I'm the benefit of that, the pro of that is I've I've felt far more content mm -hmm. at, at overall overall right. Um, even things I'm very emotionally affected by and and worried about sometimes when i distance myself a bit from it in, in terms of informationally each day i feel like okay i'm not i'm i feel like i'm in just a slightly better mood i'm a better able to deal with things the cost is i feel like i'm um just hiding from things i need to more directly engage with like so i sometimes feel like oh i'm a bit disconnected with what's happening with humanity and I mean, i'm just going into this cave right and mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find a better sweet spot. Like I'm sort of experimenting with like, how do I read the news in a way that doesn't make me, you know, incredibly sad and, and frustrated. I think maybe the last, and this is a topic for our, maybe a, a next discussion is often read. So we're talking about, you know, checking our, our ability to read the news and consume the news and to be you know mindful about it. But, you know, one thing we haven't touched on is new reading the news these days can be like an can be like an addiction hmm. to a chemical substance so like you know mike when you were struggling with addiction if i said to you oh just you know just think about you know not smoking anymore and you'll be fine and just don't do it you'd be like okay well that's probably that's probably a simplistic understanding of where addiction comes from and how to get through it yeah you know there's some truth there it is, it is yeah, something you yeah, should yeah, do yeah. but it's if news con consumption today is like drugs and in, i bet newspapers design it in this way and i don't mean to be conspiratorial but it's a great way to get people to, you know, great way to get eyeballs. How do we then manage that? If we view news consumption, you know, as as a form of addiction and drug abuse or, or substance compulsive abuse. Compulsive behavior would be the, yeah. probably the right term. Yes, okay. Um, and maybe the, the same brain mechanisms are, are activated that we need to understand. And so if you feel like you just can't think through your approach to news, maybe that signals there's some compulsive behavior stuff mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. and then how do you unpack that <laughs> so to create a more healthy relationship with this the substance we call news yes yeah i do think what we the framework in some sense that we've already laid out can apply mm. and that is a question that we don't have time to i guess explore in this moment maybe we Stay will tuned. next time although all the standard approaches still kind of apply is this serving me? Yes or no. Do I want mm. a better relationship to this? Yes or no. Right. If you don't, then go on. Keep calm, carry on idea. If you do want to feel better or you are aware that these things are interfering with your daily life and the way you interact with the people around you and you you can acknowledge that it's not healthy, then good. That You need That's to the, answer that question. And then if the answer is yes, then a lot of the things we've talked about apply. Right. If you don't want to change, then 
<laughs> Keep going. You're yeah. probably not listening to this and <laughs> off, off you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mike, thank you. You're welcome. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank David. you. Yeah. Uh, hope you found that useful. Please remember if you have any questions or comments or topics you'd like us to discuss in the future, please get in touch with us. The contact information is on the website or in the description of this always. And we hope you have a good day in your relationship to the news. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe enjoy. we could take a break. Yeah. All right. See you. Bye. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.